me today. I actually have to read from the book, which I can no longer see. <laughs> this is a really compelling story that hardly ever uh, preached on. It's actually much more important uh, than its given rank in the lectionary. It's a story that comes from uh, Peter. I'm in the in Acts, and uh, in the early church, the, a bunch of Romans came to visit Peter, and it became kind of a, a point, I'm going to explain in just a few minutes, of the real importance and a turning point in the life of the church. At any rate, after they come, and he's deciding whether he's going to meet with them as equals, really, or not, it says, about noon, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He was hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the guests, or the hosts, were preparing his meal. He fell into a trance or a dream. Romans were very big on trances and dreams. He saw the heaven open up, and something like a large sheet came down, and it was lowered to the ground by its four corners, and in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles, shrimp and lobsters, and all kinds of birds of the air. And he heard a voice say, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, because I have never eaten anything which is not kosher. And the second time he heard the same voice, and the voice said to him, Peter, what God has made clean, you must no longer call profane or unkosher. This happened to him three times, and suddenly it was taken away into the heavens. He receives these Romans who come to visit him, and then later this is his conclusion that he draws. Truly I perceive that God shows no partiality towards any of us, but whoever does what is right is accepted by God. Apart from their extraordinary contribution to human happiness, what do the following people have in common? Erasmus, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, the playwright Christopher Marlowe, King James I of England, Sir Francis Bacon, the greatest scientist of his day, Thomas Gray, Frederick the Great of Germany, Margaret Fuller, Tchaikovsky, Nijinsky, Proust, A. E. Hausman, T. E. Lawrence, Walt Whitman, Henry James, Edith Hamilton, W. H. Auden, Willa Cather, Tennessee Williams, and the tennis star Martina Navratilova. They were all gays and lesbians. By the way, that was the opening to a sermon I wrote in 1995, when I told the congregation that two gay men had asked me to perform their wedding, which was not something that was yet legal in New Jersey. But I brought it up to the congregation because the future beckoned us forward to make a statement about where we stood vis-a-vis -vis gay families. We spent a year in dialogue and study on that subject with the Bible in one hand and the scientific literature in the other hand. And I remember the book on Chan that Chandler Burr wrote on a comprehensive review of sexual orientation that turned out to be much more complex than any of us had any idea about how our sexual orientation is formed and why it appears to exist on a scale that runs between exclusively heterosexual to exclusively homosexual and how homosexual behavior is not so much deviant as most of us were taught as children, but merely a deviation from the norm. And it comprises about 4%, very predictably, in every single population. And we looked at the Bible, but we used this story in particular because this little story turns out to have a huge hermeneutical tool that we need to interpret the Bible on any moral or social subject. The Old Testament, indeed, has a few passages that read something like this. If a man lies with another man as though he were a woman, it is an abomination. And that sounds pretty serious. It was certainly delivered that way to me by fundamentalist preachers in the South who read the Bible rather literally when I was a kid. Except that that word, toleva, abomination, is actually not so serious. It means that you're not kosher, you're not ritually pure, you're not orthodox Jewish. Eating pork is also an abomination. Lobster, shrimp, scampi, 
also an abomination, having sex during menstruation, an abomination, lots of things are an abomination that are detailed in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So it had the moral effect of saying, you know, good Jewish boys just don't do this. It's a line I believe that was repeated from the time of Moses all the way up to my grandmother who taught me essentially the same thing. So what do you do with these passages from the past that reflect the mores of an earlier era? You let the future guide you, like this pivotal little story in Acts makes clear. And it was really revolutionary for Christians because the biggest question for the first Christians was whether regular Romans had to become Jews in order to become Christians. After all, Jesus was a Jew. All the disciples were Jews. And Jesus' teaching spread very quickly, and ordinary Romans wanted to follow in the way of Jesus. But for the adult men who had never been circumcised, part of becoming Jewish, of course, requires you to be circumcised. They met it with a big, whoa, wait a minute. Can we review this one more time? This was the first big debate in the church, and it was very divisive. Orthodox Jews, of course, in order to be Orthodox, had to eat different food. They had to actually eat separately and stay separately from Romans when they ate. It meant that you had Jews over here and Romans over here, say, at the church picnic. Not good for community. Peter and Paul had many discussions about this subject. Peter took the orthodox position, saying everybody had to become Jewish. Paul took the more inclusive position. They went back and forth, back and forth the way that these things do. And Peter has this dream. He has the same dream three times. In the Roman world, that means it comes from God. And in the dream, God collects all these things that are not kosher into one huge blanket and says, those things which were formerly not kosher, I now declare are kosher. It's an amazing story because we have a God saying, all that stuff I prohibited in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, that no longer matters. So apparently God can change God's mind. Not just a little, but a lot. And perhaps more miraculous than changing God changing God's mind, Peter changes his mind too. Peter says, truly I perceive that God is not partial towards any nation or any religion, but whoever stands in respectful awe before God and does what is right is acceptable. The spark jumps the gap for Peter. Jesus taught them already to go into every nation. Jesus taught them it's not what you put in your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Jesus taught them that treating your neighbor like yourself is more important than whether or not they are heretical, like Samaritans were or whether or not they were women, or whether or not they were slaves or lepers who were also not kosher or tax collectors because God is inclusive. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells the disciples that they don't actually possess all of the truth right now. He says the future Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. So we can't just ask ourselves, what did we do yesterday? We have to continually ask ourselves, what will become true for the rising generation? What is coming next? And the Bible isn't given to us as a set of eternal spiritual computer codes that all you have to do is parse and to unlock the key on how we have to live. It's an evolving truth that's dependent upon us being led by the Spirit to figure things out in a new era. So for us, when we looked at gays and lesbians, we turned to science because we live in a scientific world. And our best science explained that sexual orientation is a given on a spectrum that we're largely just born with. This is the way God made us. So for us as a community, the spiritual question became, how do we live in love and acceptance with the LBGTQ world? How do we express compassion and make a place for their families? How do we raise our children to live in a world where knowing that there are gays and lesbians and bisexual and transgendered people, we can show respect and understanding so that all of us can live integrated spiritual lives together. And the miracle for us, like the miracle for Peter, was that we stopped waiting for them to change and finally figured out that it's we who need to change. This was the truth that the Spirit led us into. I couldn't help but think about that this week reading the paper. 
You have to dig past the first five stories almost every day this week, which are something nutty that comes from Washington. Just ignore that. But then you get to two stories about big change from the past to the future. One of them was the Boy Scouts, one of the most traditional organizations you can imagine. By the way, formerly headed by our Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, and now headed by a former Secretary of Defense and former head of the CIA, Robert Gates. These are great Republicans, decidedly not politically correct liberals. And the Boy Scouts decided to accept gay scouts, and they decided to accept transgendered scouts several years ago. And this week, they made a place to accept girls in scouting so that they can now earn the Eagle Scout badge as well. The leaders, over a long period of time, have started to think through the issue of the world that our children are going to live in soon. And they started to ask themselves the question about what would they need in order to adapt successfully in that world. And they transcended the traditional mores of a simpler earlier era to make the virtue of scouting available to a whole new generation for a whole new world. By the way, I'd just like to point out that our very own Emil Raffolo is involved in the national leadership of the Boy Scouts for over a decade now. Just this month, I got a notice from their national executive director that Emil is going to be awarded the God and Country Award, which is quite an honor. Usually, the religious people that get interviewed on these matters are standing four square against any changes like the Mormon Church. And I can't tell you how proud I am to have leaders from Christ Church that are standing with their eyes fixed decidedly on the future, not on the past, ready to transcend the boundaries of yesteryear to make our world a more inclusive place. And the second headline, where the future just drove us to transcend the past, was a little notice that Malala Mustafa, the girl whose school in Pakistan was burned down by the Taliban, and she stood up in protest even as a middle school student, only to be shot by the Taliban. She enrolled at Oxford University to study politics and economics. It's the Taliban's worst nightmare. <laughs> An educated woman with moral grit. But what a huge step forward it will be for us to educate women the world over. I was sitting there reading that, remembering my grandmothers were actively discouraged from going to college in the 20s. Almost no women went to college. And by the way, almost none of the top 150 colleges in the United States even accepted women until the 60s. I know Wake Forest didn't, Princeton didn't. It remains the case that two-thirds of the illiterate adults in our world are women because they're treated as second-class citizens in too many places. And when you have that, you have this imbalance of power in the family. You have this imbalance of power in society where men lord it over their women, like Harvey Weinstein. This has been the norm for hundreds and thousands of years. But the future, as we know, our gender distinctions are going to matter less and less. And after 70 years of admitting women to college in the United States, now there are slightly more women enrolled and slightly more women who will graduate than men. And we know that all of our outreach efforts in the developing nations, that when you empower women with education and skills that allow them to develop economic independence, you also get a balance of power in the family. And if you get a balance of power in the family, you get balance in more stable families because women also invest more in their children than men do. And when you have stable families, you're much more likely to develop stable democratic societies. So our outreach partners in Nicaragua at Christ Church are all women's cooperatives because you get this radial multiplication of your investment. But we want Christ Church to be the church of the future. We already have too many churches and mosques that look to the past. They want to go back to the seventh century to Sharia law. Our Orthodox churches who speak Greek in their liturgy that comes from the 5th century that nobody today can even understand, or in Russian from a 7th century Slavonic that none of the people at the church can actually understand. So it allows you to meditate in a wonderful, time-honored way, but it actually ends up taking you out of the world, not in it. 
And meanwhile, the most significant challenges to us spiritually come from a future that changes so rapidly that our society is now in uncharted water. We have never been at this place before in our social evolution. And our grandchildren will have tools in their hands to directly modify our gene pool. It's going to allow us to prevent inheritable diseases from ever afflicting some of our families again. But of course, it's also going to allow us to make a generation of children that are smarter than the rest of us, more handsome, maybe more athletic. So how are they going to deploy this technical ability? What moral guidelines should we develop for this godlike power? Society's technical abilities proceed quickly. What we need is for the church to help develop moral imagination so that we can keep up. But right now, we're living through another revolution of our consciousness because of our abundant social media. You know, when I first started teaching at Rutgers University in the 80s, I noticed that my students would lose attention after a while, even though it was a very interesting class, not because I taught it, but I was teaching ethics at the time. Kids really like that. And I realized that subconsciously, they had been programmed from watching television their entire life, and what they were looking for every seven minutes was a break, a commercial break. Even National Public Radio says, we'll be right back after this short break, even though they don't have commercials. So I started telling a joke or a story every seven minutes, and then I'd return to the material problem solved by adapting to our new consciousness. Today, people are being interrupted more and more frequently with calls, texts, and updates. We have studies already that can show you retain less information when you are more dependent upon technology for more and more answers. We actually can fo focus less intensely and we can only focus for shorter periods of time. Our very consciousness is evolving in significant ways that the previous generation knew nothing about. How will we change? How should we change? We need a moral imagination to keep pace with our technical prowess. The power of God through what Christians call the Holy Spirit gives us that power to change and it's a profound, powerful thing. I think of F.W. de Klerk when he was president of South Africa. You know, he'd grown up as an Afrikaner, proud to be an Afrikaner, his country's great heritage throwing off colonial rule by the British. He established a vibrant economy in South Africa. They believed that apartheid was a noble ideal because it allowed each of the different ethnic groups in South Africa to develop self-rule, and they thought that was a good thing. But through the 1980s, he came to see that apartheid had become unjust, however well-intentioned his grandparents might have been when they founded it in the 1890s. And it's true that he was helped to see that immorality by a well-disciplined protest movement led by Nelson Mandela. And it's true that the nations of the world put a great deal of pressure on South Africa and the National Party to end apartheid for many years. But people do not change simply because they're told to change, particularly when that pressure comes from the outside. It actually makes genuine change often more difficult. De Klerk had a number of meetings with the leaders of the National Party, and they asked themselves this question, what is the right thing to do? It's a question that real leaders ask themselves in difficult situations. And this is what he said, in the end I came to the conclusion, not only me but also the other leaders of the National Party, that apartheid would not work, that it had failed to bring justice, and that it had become manifestly unjust, and that from a moral point of view it was indefensible, and that it could not be repaired by improving it. So we reached the conclusion that we must make a 180 degree turn in our thinking. And several years later, after we had founded the Truth and Reconciliation Commission with the ANC, I made a profound apology on national TV for the pain and humiliation and destitution that apartheid had caused so many people. The ANC would sometimes like you to believe that I just had to do it, that it was merely a pragmatic decision, but I can assure you that within my party, we had a long process of asking ourselves, what is the right thing to do? What can we bring justice to the people? And that, if I can put it on a scale, was the driving force behind our decision. Change can happen. It's rare, it's difficult, that's why we call it divine. But we follow a spiritual leader that taught us that it's the higher way,
Jesus showed us how not just to ask the question, why, but also to ask the question, why not? He taught us to envision a better world, a world infused with God. He called it the kingdom of God. And may you be blessed with the divine spirit to change. May you see the future challenges and inspire new visions with the question, why not? May we all come to ask the more beautiful question. Our children and our grandchildren are begging for that kind of genuine leadership. Amen.